The Cyber Career Lab was created for people who cannot afford thousands of dollars for degree programs or certification training. Our guided lessons expose beginning and intermediate professionals to relevant content that equips them to enter the workforce and grow in their careers. By pairing engaging sessions with great instructors and guests, we have succeeded in creating a valuable experience for all experience levels. Whether you're thinking about entering the field, you have some experience, or you consider yourself a subject matter expert, the Cyber Career Lab is going to have something positive to add to your knowledge, your wisdom, and your experience. Our weekly lessons and support from our online community are designed to equip participants to keep growing in, crit in critical cybersecurity knowledge. Closing the cybersecurity skills gap is difficult because few organizations focus on equipping early career professionals for success. Many of the people who want to join the workforce have no idea where to get started or they cannot afford expensive degree and or professional certification programs. Class LLC and our good friends like Malcolm Harkins are solving this problem by allowing people to join interactive lessons, pay what they can afford. We only accept donations. There is no fee for this and we're sharing the best content and information that is available in the marketplace. For this session, it is my pleasure to bring Malcolm Harkins back as our guest lecturer. For this session, Malcolm will take a deep dive into the nine box of controls so that people have a better understanding and better perspective about how to manage cybersecurity risk without struggling with compliance or focusing on the wrong problems. So with that, Malcolm, I'll let you introduce yourself for those who don't know you, and then you can take it away on our deep dive conversation. Thanks, Keon. Uh, again, Malcolm Harkins, I, I currently do board work and advisory uh, stuff for a wide variety of, of security startups, um, but I also mentor and coach uh, as much as possible CISOs or, or folks that are trying to enter the career path and, and try and give back and share some of my perspective to make their journey a little bit easier. Uh, prior to that, I was at a web application security defense company um, for about 20 months. Prior to that, I was Chief Security and Trust Officer with Silence Corporation, uh, which uh, some of you may know that was hired by BlackBerry a couple of years ago. And prior to that, I spent my life uh, at a little company called Intel Corporation, uh, where I was Chief Security and Privacy Officer. So uh, been around a lot, and, and uh, but I'm also a bit of an oddball, which will help uh, probably explain some of the nine box control concepts. I'm not a technologist by by training or background. I just grew up in the tech industry. Uh, most of my time at Intel prior to tripping my way into security was in finance, procurement, business operations. So really uh, grew up on the business side of things and those type of business process controls around procurement and finance and business operations. And then, you know, trip my way into security after 9-11, I read a NIMDA. So that is a little bit of a background on me. Let, let me then kind of pivot from that and, and, and tell you my evolution of, of creating this nine box of controls, and then I'll start walking through. So when I landed in running uh, security and continuity, business continuity in Intel's IT organization in late 2001, Andy Grove was still running Intel. He had a book that he uh, was titled Only the Paranoid Survive. He was that guy and he was frankly beating the crap out of a bunch of people to be able with the availability risk issues physically and logically that uh, many folks had uh, had seen um, or experienced in, in the summer fall of 2001. Now, for me being a, a business guy, a finance guy, I always looked at where I needed to spend money and where I needed to spend effort needed to be delivered with effort to get an outcome, something that you could demonstrate that you delivered positive business impact, right? When a, when a venture capitalist invests in a company, they expect a return. In an internal company, when, when you go ask for money and they get capital and people and, and resources, they expect a return, either revenue, right? Uh, a market penetration, uh, you know, cost efficiency gains. I spend money to save money. You know, you, you have to deliver a business outcome. So when I landed in security, I'm like, okay, well, what does Intel, its shareholders, Andy Grove, the executive staff, 
require from me? What outcomes do I need to try and deliver? And, and so late 2001, I'm like, okay, well, obviously there's a risk outcome that I need to deliver, but there's also a budget outcome. Uh, and, and for me, being a former finance person, I always looked at total cost, not actually my exact budget, but the total cost implications of what I was doing so that I could really measure the economic uh, expenditure well beyond just my budget. Um, and that's basically where I had, I had framed myself. OK, I've got cost and I've got risk. Um, and that that formed the basis of things that I needed to do now uh, a few years later. Let's say the implementation of controls that I took was blunt. Uh, back in those early days, I did a pop up to people's laptops and I gave them 30 seconds to save whatever they could and I forced patching. Why? To get a level of hygiene. Well, I was given free reign to do that for a while, but that wasn't the best user experience. And this is where the notion of this third dimension that I'll explain of control friction comes in. And so I evolved my thinking saying, I've got to deliver three outcomes, one on risk, one on cost, and one on business velocity or the lack of disruption uh, to the business based upon what I'm doing. Now, fast forward the clock um, years later, those were my three outcomes. I then start going, well, what does a hero security product look like? Right. I'm like, well, one that uh, delivers a risk reduction, allows me to lower and flatten my total cost of controls, and then one that reduces or removes uh, friction and improves business velocity. And again, I'm still at Intel, but Intel was starting to make investments in security companies at that time. But that's how I judged then where the company should make security investments. That's how I started judging how I should look at my security investments in my budget, right? To really kind of refine based upon those outcomes. Again, roll forward the clock a few years later, as I'm leaving Intel, I'm working on my third book. I, you know, started at Silence. It was a prevention oriented company. And, and with that, you're going to have a bias towards prevention, which I agree with. But but in some cases, that that bias towards prevention led to some strange behaviors at times where from a marketing perspective, the company had wanted to talk about detection and response as somehow less than. And and so I got into a bit of a, an argument with one of the executives on that. And, and I said, well, you you know, they had never managed risk and security. They had they were a, a sales um, executive. And I was like, hey, let, me, let me show you how the world works and how it's supposed to work and and how, frankly, the industry has confused everybody on on what controls do and what they don't do and how we be framing this. And so I went to a whiteboard and I drew the nine box of controls. Uh, and, and so I went and started and said, let's let's think about um, risk. It doesn't matter if it's physical risk, logical risk, uh, almost any type of risk. There's three primary ways that you can um, control for risk. You can prevent it, you can detect it, and you can respond to it. And, and when you go from prevention to response on that vertical axis, risk grows. Because if you're reacting to things, that means bad things are already happening, right? And, and so I said, okay, well now let, let's talk about the ways in which you can approach controls. You can do controls in an automated fashion, semi-automated and manual. As you go from automation to manual, cost grows. Why? Because you're throwing bodies at it. And it's going to take longer, which is an implicit um, cost to the business. So, so let's start with that. You know, you go prevention to response and risk grows, automated to manual cost grows. So now when, when we look at these things, instead of confusing this whole protection and let's dissect the three macro control types, prevention is the only true form of minimizing vulnerability, thus the potential for harm. Why? Because you prevented it from occurring. But the reality is you can't eliminate risk, right? We can't eliminate it physically. We can't eliminate it logically. We can't even eliminate it in the financial market. So even if I sit on cash, right, and sitting in the bank, we know we have inflation risk. 
right? So you can't eliminate risk in any way, shape, or form, but you can manage it. And the way in which you manage is prevent it, detect it, or respond to it. But, but when you get into past prevention, what are detection and response controls? They're damage minimization controls. Because when you're detecting and responding to things, bad things are already starting to occur. And so you're trying to minimize damage. Right, so again, I'll, I'll give a non-security analogy uh, for those that are new to this, and then, then we'll do what I'll call a walk the box exercise, and we'll talk about some security controls here in a few minutes too. Uh, think of a smoke detector. That is a detective control that's automated, but then the semi-automated to manual part of it is, I have to go figure out why the alarm is going off. And if there's a fire or something smoldering, then we've got to exit the building. Now, the fire alarm is meant to preserve life, right? It's meant to alert the people in the potential building or, or house that has a fire so that you can exit. So it prevents the loss of life if people take the automated and semi-automated actions, but it doesn't prevent the fire. Think of a, a, a sprinkler system, right? That is a detective automated control with a preventive trigger, which triggers the water flow. Now that again, preserves the building to some extent, but there'll be water damage, but it's meant to preserve life. So you're preventing harm to people because you're dousing the fire, but you are creating some level of harm, though less harm to the building because you've got water damage. So again, even in that analogy, you can start seeing, okay, prevention, detection, response, and obviously the response mechanism is the fire department comes, right? Um, which is, again, a highly manual effort and so therefore, when you go into this and you look at the security industry, and I've done this a number of times, and some, some organizations are weighted slightly differently, I will ask them to go look at their staffing, look at their spending, uh, and, and in this, not only their budget, but the total cost side of things, and go, where are you anchored when you look at all of your cost, not just your budget, you know, the implications on IT time, implications on legal's time for dealing with the breach incident, uh, time with executives, you know, dealing with, with uh, problems, and, and where, where do you fit if you were to look at a waiting perspective? And I've found over time, looking at just the countless dialogues I have with peers, and when I look at the marketplace of the security technologies that exist and all the service and support and incidents and stuff like that, I go as an industry at a macro level, we're kind of stuck in the semi-automated to manual detection and response space. I mean, you just look at the line day in and day out, whether it be the Colonial Pipeline, the uh, recent you know, uh, stuff in the news on water systems potentially you know, being hacked the, to poison water, the, the similar thing in Florida, all the ransomware attacks, all that stuff. That, that's an anchoring in semi-automated to manual detection and response, right? Because something bad happened, which means again, we're reacting to it. And, I, and I, I'm also a jaded person. And again, being a former business guy, you look at it and you go, how does the industry make money? You know, and I've been on the security solution provider side now for several years. The industry makes money when risk occurs and it sells you a solution to try and manage and mitigate that risk. Well, if the solutions were highly effective, then why would we have so much reaction and so much damage? Right? And so if it's, if you think about it, and you go, well, this upper right quadrant, it's the highest risk, highest cost, and most liability. Well, if it's the highest cost to me as a business owner, yeah, I'm making widgets, I run a restaurant, I, uh, you know, I'm some hospital, if it's the highest cost to my organization, that's the most revenue for the industry. 
And so, so I also look at it and go, does the industry as a whole, there are individual players in the industry who absolutely have a focus and an incentive and an efforts to prevent harm. But at a macro level, if the industry revenue grows when risk occurs and it's the highest cost to the customers, that's the most revenue for the industry. So then you have to start questioning the economic motivations of the industry. And it's not because the industry is bad, but I will tell you when you think about it that way, it also causes you to start thinking about the roadmaps of your vendors and solution providers, what they're trying to market to you, and, and whether or not their strategy is to keep you hooked on a ever-growing basis of, of uh, bubblegum bailing wire and, and uh, duct tape to make up for something that didn't work because they're going to maximize their, their profit and loss. They're going to maximize their revenue at your expense. And I can tell you I've experienced this because you know, I've had solution providers who've sold into me where the efficacy of their control has gone down in some areas, but they're there to sell me something else and upsell me to the next thing, right? So again, think about that as you're engaging um, and looking at these type of controls and whether or not their economic incentives are actually beneficial to the economics of your organization and whether or not their motivations um, are really to try and solve the problem or just sell you more crap. Um, which in some cases that's that's uh, truly what's occurring. So now let, let's talk about this third dimension of friction. So controls are a drag coefficient. They slow down people, data, and business processes, chew up unnecessary compute cycles. And in a high control friction environment, one of two things occurs. If, if I've uh, created friction and I've slowed down a business and or a business process or, uh, and users in an environment, I've just added a business cost because I've slowed business velocity. So it takes more bodies to get things done. It takes more compute power to get something done. It, 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 I have to exhaust unnecessary cycles to make up for the, the slowing effect of the controls. And again, I, I've, I've asked, I've experienced it because I'm also a user besides being a security professional. I've created friction and I've seen its impact on the business. Uh, and, and I've asked hundreds and hundreds of peers when I've talked about this on stage and, and done other things like this in, in, uh, in full formats. And I go, how many of your users or how many of your business executives can state that the security controls improved their business velocity and improved their ability to hit their objectives. Nobody raises their hand, which means that at a minimum it's benign to business velocity, but more importantly, there's a, a negative effect on this. And, and so in, in that negative effect, one of two things happens. Either an organization from a cultural perspective adheres to the controls, because the people and the processes and stuff, if somebody says turn left, they turn left. If somebody says stand still, they stand still. If, if you're in a, you know, give an order, somebody takes an order and they execute an order and the orders around security are followed and it's, and it's unintended consequences is slowing people down, that creates a systemic business risk because now you've slowed time to market, you've slowed product development, you slowed servicing a customer, that, that creates a financial issue for an organization. And, and that's the thing that, that uh, we all have to think about in the security side of, of that, in essence, risk that we just created because of the friction. Now, the other thing that happens in, I'd say most organizations, the end user or the business goes around the control. They have an objective, they have a mission, they have a need that they're measured on, on their business outcome that they're held accountable for. And if a security control gets in the way of doing and hitting that goal, they go around it. Hence, why do we have all this 
shadow IT dialogue? Why do we have people breaking controls? Well, because it didn't help them get their job done. Now, when that occurs, we just spent money on a control to only have it be, in essence, thwarted by the business itself. And so we've created a false sense of control. So we've wasted money on a security control and we've generated more risk. And you go, OK, well, OK, puzzle me this. Why would we be so stupid to do that? Why would the industry sell us stuff that re increases friction and drives my users and business around me? Well, if the business of security is to grow its revenue and I just sold you something and promised you it reduced risk to only have your users and business go around you to introduce new risk, then I can sell you monitoring your employee. I can sell you on the, the shadow IT. I can sell you all these other things to make up for the fact that I didn't do a good architectural design of the control, which actually generated another risk issue. So again, the jaded finance person in me says, maybe the industry doesn't have an economic incentive either to solve the friction problem, because when there's friction, there's risk, and where there's risk, there's money to be made by the industry. But it's up to us then, the operators of security, to understand these dynamics and then do what I've always tried to do, shift left to automation. Why? To reduce cost. Push down from response to prevention. Not that you can eliminate risk, but again, it's the mechanism for continuous improvement to deliver risk returns and risk reduction. And then I've got to strip away friction and improve business velocity. Hence my tagline, protect to enable. If we're protecting to enable people in business processes, we are looking at this multi-dimensional nine box of controls and always trying to shift it. Gravity is always going to pull us up to the upper right. Why? Because you can't eliminate risk and some things are going to get out in front of us. There's going to be new, new attacks, new technology, new, new ways of doing things. So gravity is going to pull us up there. So how do we fight the gravitational forces? Well, we shift left to automation, push down to prevention, and then kind of push in and removing control friction.